All right. Thank you. Please be seated. Did we flip the clocks? Okay, great. We are here today for oral argument in the case of GHB Construction LLC versus Gary Solomon et al. Our case number one, CACV 190781. We're here today for oral argument. Each side is allocated 20 minutes in which to conduct their arguments. Uh, Counsel for Appellant, if you want to reserve some time, you can stay seated. Uh, if you want to reserve some time, you may, but we leave it to you to police that. We don't tell you, hey, your time's up and you've got five minutes left or whatever. Um, we have conferenced this case this morning. We reviewed the record and read your briefs, so we are pretty familiar with the facts. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're making your arguments. Um, this matter is being recorded, we hope. <laughs> Uh, and people will be able to listen to it and watch it live and also we'll post it later to YouTube so you can go back and critique yourselves and us when you uh, feel the need. I think, I've looked at some of those and there's like seven or eight views and I always wonder who those other six people are that watch <laughs> these. But, uh, we put it up there anyway. Um, with that, I think, unless I've missed something, Judge Murray, did you just No? Uh, we will begin. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Oh, uh, if you want to, since you're sitting by yourselves, if you want to take your masks off during argument, feel free. We're, you're far away from enough from us that it doesn't bother me at all. Understood. I'll, I'll go ahead and do so. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, panel. Cody Huffaker on behalf of the appellant, GHB Construction. Um, despite being a litigator, this is my first time back in a physical courtroom since March, so I appreciate the opportunity to do this in person. It's also my first time putting on a suit since March, which I have not missed, but either way, I'm, I'm grateful for that. not thanking us for that. <laughs> I'm not thanking you for that, no. Um, I will skip a summary of the facts and maybe answer any questions that the panel has about those later, but go ahead and dive right into what I think are the two crux legal issues that the court needs to look at to determine this appeal. Uh, first is whether the trial court properly applied the statute of repose in Arizona's Fraudulent Transfer Act. No, it did not, as I'll get to in a minute. And the second is, did GHB have notice of the fraudulent nature of the transfers at issue in this case by virtue of the June 1st, 2011 recorded deeds? Well, now, before you move on past that, because this is the one thing that kind of sticks in my mind, what more did you need to know than he was transferring property, that property had been transferred to family members? Good question, Your Honor. The consideration paid for the property, and this goes to the heart of the case. It's addressed in the Transamerica decision. In fact, the Transamerica decision, despite predating Arizona's adoption of the Fraudulent Transfer Act, it addresses directly the circumstances under which a creditor may be put on notice of the fraudulent nature of a transfer by virtue of language in, an, in a deed. And it looked at two hallmarks that could be present in a deed. It looked at the parties. It also looked at consideration. And there are several quotes in, in Transamerica that directly apply to this case. Um, on, on consideration, the Transamerica court held that, quote, where a deed explicitly sets forth facts detailing the entire consideration given for the property, creditors are deemed to have discovered any inadequacy of consideration when the deed was recorded. What did the consideration, what was stated in the deed in this case? In this case, every single deed said for $10 and other valuable consideration, which is language that is nearly identical to the language in Transamerica, where the court held that that language did not, as a matter of law, put creditors on notice of the fraudulent nature of a transfer. Isn't that pretty standard language? It is fairly standard language, Your Honor. However, the, the language in Transamerica is clear that it has to explicitly state inadequacy of consideration to put a creditor on notice legally of the fraudulent nature of the transfer. Well, except, and I don't mean to monopolize this, but it puts you on notice when it's a family member, and isn't there an obligation, at least on your part, at that point in time to investigate that, that to do some due diligence on whether or not this, there was adequate consideration? Good question. So there are several elements of a fraudulent transfer, and the parties receiving or transferring the deed is just one of them. Family members transfer each other property all the time. A husband may transfer property to himself and to his wife to create a joint tenancy. 
a couple may transfer property to a trust to though those are all two insiders and they all cite exemption codes but they don't put creditors at large on notice as a matter of law that that transfer may be fraudulent and that's all that are in these deeds here there's a hallmark of a transfer from gary solomon to solomon global llc or to his sister's entity franco anderson llc but they all say for valuable consideration and importantly Mr. Solomon has admitted in his answering brief that he sold these properties as part of his retirement plan. So not only is, is inadequacy of consideration not explicit on the face of the deed. You as didn't answer my question. What's the, what is the due diligence requirement for you to investigate what consideration was actually paid with these terms? So I understand the question properly, properly, Your Honor. What is the exact due diligence creditors must undertake? That's a question of fact for the jury, and it's going to be case specific. And it should have been a question of fact for the jury in this case. Mr. Hatch, through Mr. Hatch's GHB's principal. I'm going to let you recognize that there is some obligation on the creditor's part to determine whether or not there was adequate consideration. There is an obligation on the creditor's part to conduct due diligence to discover if a transfer was, if the nature of a transfer was fraudulent. Yes. But and that, at what point is that triggered? There's no hard timeline, Your Honor. That's a question of fact for the jury to determine whether they did it too early, too late. And what Transamerica holds is that the deed and the contents of the deed are what the trier of fact can weigh in addition to the other allegations of when and why a creditor looked at a deed. But that's not what happened here. What happened here is the court determined as a matter of law that no reasonable trier of fact could look at these deeds and determine anything other than they were a fraudulent transfer which under the language of Transamerica, that's, that's not correct. Transamerica says it has to be reasonable diligence, correct? The statute says it has to be reasonable and diligence. And Transamerica follows that. Correct. Did you put, what was the evidence you put forward to the, to the trial judge to say, this is a jury issue because we can show this is the reasonable diligence that we undertook? Understood, Your Honor. So we were on a 12B6 motion to dismiss. There were allegations made that Mr. Hatch, let, let me provide a little more context. I think that will help. Uh, Mr. Hatch obtained a judgment against Mr. Solomon on October 30th, 2014. Mr. Solomon appealed. That was affirmed on appeal in June of 2016. And a few things happened in that window. First, uh, Mr. Hatch was fighting the appeal. Second, he assigned the judgment to GHB and GHB became involved in other litigation, separate litigation with Mr. Solomon. And it was Mr. Hatch's allegations in the first amended complaint and his and in his declaration attached to the response to the first motion to dismiss that his bandwidth was low and that he didn't look for or discover the deeds themselves until december of 2015 which is outside the four-year transfer window but then within 10 months of december 2015 he filed the ghb filed the complaint counsel are you telling me that there's a different standard for poor creditors versus wealthy creditors no, I'm not, Your Honor. I, I'm saying that the jury should be the one to decide that question and not the court on a Rule 12b-6 motion to dismiss. What, what question? The, what question? The question of whether GHB exercised reasonable diligence in discovering the fraudulent nature of the transfers. A creditor could look at this deed and notice that maybe it was between insiders but have no knowledge about the consideration paid for the, the transfers. The jury would have to decide if you alleged reasonable diligence. So that's what I'm trying to get. What was the reasonable diligence you alleged that that you made, and it sounds like you just said, we didn't even look at the, the, the deeds until long after the statute of limitations would have run. The allegation, Your Honor, was that Mr. Hatch discovered the deeds when he went to go uh, serve a writ of execution on personal property that Mr. Solomon owned. He then discovered that Mr. Solomon had transferred that personal property and then ran a more fulsome assam search and discovered the deeds in December and all 2015. This was after the four-year period of repose would have occurred. Uh, correct, Your Honor. However, the, the statute of repose allows that. Statute of repose allows a creditor to bring a claim after the expiration of the four-year window if, through the exercise of reasonable diligence, they discovered or could have discovered the fraudulent nature of the transfer. Now, the trial court misapplied that statute completely. It looked at reasonable diligence in discovering the transfers themselves, which is not the case law, not what the statute says. What the analysis needed to be was did Mr. Hatch exercise 
reasonable diligence in discovering the fraudulent nature of the transfers and assuming the truth of his well well played allegations that he was tied up in several different pieces of litigation and that he filed within one year after discovering the deeds a trier of fact could look at that and say no we don't think that's reasonable diligence or a trier of fact could look at that and say yeah we think that that's reasonable diligence but the point is so that's for I'm, the trier of fact there's i'm involved in multiple litigation exception to the requirement for reasonable diligence there's no uh, your honor i understand the question there's no hard and fast rule for what constitutes reasonable diligence and the court doesn't need to hold today that being involved in separate litigation gives you the right to wait what the court needs to hold is that GHB should allow, be allowed to get that issue in front of the trier of fact, who under Transamerica can then weigh Mr. Hatch's allegations, his explanations, against ambiguous language in a deed that does not on its face show a fraudulent transfer because it says consideration was paid and because Mr. Solomon has admitted that he sold and received money for these properties. And if this goes to trial, you know, you can bet a large sum of money that Mr. Solomon's main defense will be that they were not fraudulent because he received adequate consideration. I'm just curious why we should have, so a non-busy creditor, a non-busy poor creditor, a busy creditor, a, are those all facts that go to the reasonableness of their actions? Correct, Your Honor. And that's, that's under Moore v. Browning and, and almost every discovery rule case that the issue of reasonable diligence is a matter for the trier of fact. The trial court cut that off at the knees and didn't allow it to get to a trier of fact. Now, if on a motion for summary judgment or at trial, the jury determines that no, we don't think Mr. Hatch had an excuse for waiting or that yes, he did, well, then that, that finding will be made at that time, but not on a Rule 12b-6 motion to dismiss especially given the very clear language in Transamerica that the deeds form part of the analysis for the trier of fact, not the entirety of the analysis such that a creditor would have notice as a matter of law by virtue of the recording of the deeds. Did I answer your question, Your Honor? Well, I'm still stuck at the, uh, I was just too poor to check it out. Understood, Your Honor, and if that factor weighs against Mr. Hatch at trial, then it weighs against Mr. Hatch at trial. But the well, court doesn't- even get to trial if that's the only thing he's got. Well, candidly, Your Honor, if it gets to a trier of fact, the trier of fact may disagree and, and determine that he acted reasonably under the circumstances and exercising due diligence when he did. Now, the statute contemplates a four-year window to bring it regardless of when you discover the fraudulent nature of the transfer, the transfer window. But then it contemplates that if you don't file within those four years, you get additional time beyond that. If you discovered the fraudulent nature of the transfer or could have discovered it um, at that time. But that, that allegations for the trier of fact. Well, isn't a reasonable standard generally connotes an objective standard? Correct, Your Honor. Okay. But you're and I think this is where Judge McMurdy and I are having trouble, is you keep talking about this reasonableness is contingent upon the circumstances of the your, your client, which seems to cut fly in the face of what an objective standard would be. Understood, Your Honor. I'm not sure I... I... So I, 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 I'm not seeing a problem with, as a matter of law, a trial court saying, if all you're alleging is that, and I, I don't mean to make light of the allegation, but I'm poor and I'm busy. And that's why I didn't investigate these or discover these properly recorded transfers earlier and investigate them. I don't see that as a problem as saying as a matter of all, that's insufficient to allow this to get to a jury. Objectively, that is insufficient. Not sub subjectively. If it, that's why we, we're, he asked you the question. Is there a subjective standard or an objective standard? If it's objective, you lose. I, I disagree, Your Honor. I think a jury could look at that and say that, yes, Mr. Hatch exercised reasonable diligence, or, or no, he didn't. I've not seen a case cited by appellees stating that lack of funds or busyness is not a consideration that a trier of fact may look at in determining whether a creditor exercised reasonable diligence in discovering a claim. Maybe it's a weak fact. Maybe it's a middle-of-the-road so fact. So you're withdrawing it's an objective test and saying it's a subjective test. 
no your honor it's an objective test but a reasonable juror could still come to the conclusion that in the face of these allegations that a creditor acted reasonably now my client below ask it asked for leave to amend to include additional allegations that request was denied presumably if my client were provided an opportunity to amend it a second time he might be able to add additional allegations of reasonableness don't we generally require when you move to amend that you actually tell the court what allegations you're going to amend with correct your honor and there's this came up on an oral argument below it was perhaps discussed a bit in artfully but a fair reading of that transcript is that proper anything after the oral argument thing here I told you I would move to amend but and here's a copy of the proposed amendments that I would make he did not your honor because the trial court during oral argument denied the request for leave to amend had had there been an opportunity given to my client to file a rule 15 motion because right now we have nothing right there's nothing in this record that would indicate what allegations the trial court should have considered on whether or not there was a justification to amend correct your honor and that's because the trial court at least in terms of the motion for leave to amend cut it off during oral argument didn't allow it to be filed so additional allegations were not permitted to be introduced in a proper rule 15 motion so does the fact that it was raised that an oral motion completely preclude that a written motion could have been filed setting forth what the proof would have been I'm not sure that it would completely preclude it but but the trial court judge was clear that she had given one opportunity to amend and was not going to give another so for whatever reason be it because they they viewed it as a cut off of an opportunity to file a rule 15 motion a rule 15 motion was not filed does that make sense okay I can dive by back in panel unless the panel has other questions I think we jump to your second point you've got 439 438 left if you want to reserve that you can or you I thought there was a first point that you wanted to touch on to or maybe we've talked about both no I think we covered it in answering the questions panel so I'll go ahead and reserve the remaining four and a half minutes I have for rebuttal thank you very much counsel for Pelley you have 20 minutes thank you I do think there are some crit oh sorry Adam Buck I'm the counsel for a Pelley's in this case there are a couple of important issues facts that the court should be aware of you know this is a small town in Taylor there's 4,200 people a lot of people are nearby right what's that isn't there a pig farm nearby yes yeah I went to high school in st. John so so you're familiar yeah so everybody knows each other and some people are in fact related many people are related in fact these parties are related the interesting fact here is that one of the members of GHB is Dave Godfrey Dave Godfrey is married to Karen Godfrey who used to be Karen Solomon who is the only daughter of Gary and Bobby Sue Solomon so you've got an interesting situation where you've got the the person that's alleging the fraudulent transfer is married to the fraudulent transferee in some respects here the reason that's what do you mean by married in some respects I either you're married or you're not well no but there it's an LLC and she's a member of the LLC so that's why I'm saying so you know mr. Godfrey could have easily asked his wife about any of these transfers he could have done a public record search which costs nothing and and so our position is he had plenty of opportunity and really what it comes down to is they did nothing and the question is can nothing be reasonable and I think the trial the trial court said look you haven't you haven't said anything you haven't said that you did anything so how can that be reasonable well it doesn't cost any money to run a search online and so he's saying he doesn't have enough time to do anything I don't know that you can say I didn't have enough time to run a search I mean how long does that take five minutes how is this case different though than trans Western because trans Western certainly seemed to find that the the recordation alone wasn't sufficient so how do we reach a different result here than they did in trans Western 
Well, Trans America. Or, sorry, Trans America, not Trans Western. So Trans America predates the Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act, which was. But the statute it interpreted was substantially the same, same as the one we're talking about, I believe. Right, and in there, it did say the statutory period may begin to run on the date of recording if the recorded deed sets forth facts from which the aggrieved party should have realized it had a cause of action. And that's the difference. In our case, the recorded deed does give notice that these are related parties. In the Transamerica case, it did not. Well, just because they're related doesn't mean it's fraudulent. No, but it would certainly make you, if you're a creditor, you might say, I, I need to look into this. And they didn't in four years. And, you know, you, you, it's a statute of repose. You've got some four these, years to do it. Some of these transfers were, were to LLCs, though, correct? Yes, so Solomon Global is the LLC, and you can look at Solomon Global and who the members are online, too. So it's not, it's not like this is a, the deed didn't say to my daughter, Helena, it said to Solomon Global, and then you would, a party who's suspicious would then have to take the additional step of, of investigating whether Solomon Global has related parties? Yeah, who the members are of Solomon Global. Obviously, the name Solomon, Solomon, you know, it's not like it's a, a Cook Island, you know, trust or something like that. It's it's very open. But it's at least a little different than the just transfer to my daughter. So I, I I'm Except, wondering at some point looking at it at a reasonable person, I, I'm kind of torn of going, yes, it's I think it's an objective standard, uh, as we talked about earlier, and we look at what the reasonable man would do and how much do we impute knowledge of related parties to a reasonable man versus how much do we expect a reasonable man to investigate these every transfer that may exist and figure out whether there's a, re a related party there. So walk me well, through why this is a matter of law requires the guy to know about these entities or discover them. Well, I think the reason he's married to uh, the daughter uh, who, who received the transfer of the property, she's a member of the LLC. So he knows who Solomon Global is. He's married to one of the members. Uh, so it, it's not like we're asking for this huge amount of due diligence. They just, apparently he didn't even ask his wife, hey, what, what about these transfers? Um, there's really nothing. I mean, that's the problem. The trial court said, look, you didn't put anything in your pleading that says why you couldn't have discovered this within four years. And they said they kept trying to amend, and the judge said, "No, there's there's nothing here. You didn't, you haven't put anything I, I in here." I thought they put in that, that, that he was poor. Well, the allegation was, "Well, I was poor, and I couldn't do it." But that's not taking any action. Uh, you've got to do something in four years, or you you lose to the statute of repose. Is that a legal impediment? Like, a legal impediment. I'm assuming that a legal impediment would be a basis upon which to allege that I couldn't have discovered. And it, my question, I guess, then, would be, is being poor or being busy, is that a legal impediment? I would say no, because it doesn't cost anything to do to ask questions, to ask your wife a question. I mean, how much time does it take to ask your wife about these transfers? How much time is it? That's getting to be a pretty factual discussion, isn't it? Uh, well, so but if, if you hadn't been married to uh, Mrs. Solomon, Miss Solomon, would that make it a different case here, or wouldn't it be the same thing? Well, I mean, really what it came down to is they didn't put enough in the complaint to say they had done anything in the four years that they were required to do something. Not a single thing. And the judge kept asking, okay, well, what, what did you do? Did you ask questions? Did you do anything and they kept saying, no, I didn't, but the reason I didn't, and they came up with a list of reasons why they didn't, not any amount of due diligence that the judge could say, well, there's something. The burden is on whom to establish the exception to the four-year statute? On the, uh, the plaintiff who filed a complaint. Um, so it's not an affirmative defense. I guess the affirmative defense would be the statute of limitations, which would be the four years, and then... Because they the knew they would be back on him to show that. Yeah, they knew they missed the four years. There's no question that they missed the four years. Um, it was four, more than four years since the filing of the deeds, the recording of the deeds, um, 
that they filed their complaint so that's not at issue at all it's whether they could have discovered or they were unable to discover you know even if they had done due diligence which they haven't asserted but even if they had they couldn't have discovered it you know this is not a statute of limitations type analysis statute reposes different and I think a lot of their argument kind of veers into statute of limitations which makes it a little more confusing and even some of the case law talks more about statutes of limitations than statutes of repose so I think that's significant really the more v Browning case I think is is the best case we have on this particular subject it was a 2002 case and you know it says their only viable claim or the act requires them to show they did not actually discover and reasonably could not have discovered the fraudulent nature of the transfers earlier than one year before they filed their amended complaint so that's what they would GHB would have to say is they couldn't have but they didn't do anything so I mean I guess what GHB is saying is no trial court can ever make a grant a motion to dismiss on the statute of repose because there's always going to be a fact a factual issue for the trier of fact to determine so I just don't see that a bright line rule that you can't have a motion to dismiss granted because they're the fraudulent nature and when they discovered it's always going to be an issue I don't think that's helpful and I don't think it's right I mean I think it totally undermines 44 dash 1 0 0 9 the legislature specifically wanted to put a statute of repose in for whatever reason and so to have case law that basically takes it out you know I don't think that would support the legislative intent behind the uniform fraudulent transfer act now the other thing in the Jeter case that I cited you know that's the standard for a motion to dismiss under 12b6 it said since the complaint was dismissed at the pleading stage for failure to state a claim we review the well-pleaded facts alleged in the complaint is true however we do not accept as true allegations consisting of conclusions of law inferences or deductions that are not necessarily implied by well-pleaded facts unreasonable inferences or unsupported conclusions from such facts or legal conclusions alleged as facts I think these are unreasonable inferences that GHB is asking the court to to determine that doing nothing is somehow some sort of due diligence and or being poor is somehow exempts you from doing any due diligence everybody can do something regardless of how poor you are or how busy you are and so you've got to do something there's got to be some shred of something for the court to grab on to and here there just wasn't and we still don't have anything and so that's why the trial courts you know didn't give them a chance to amend again it was like well what are you gonna do I mean we have all the facts you know there's really all they're gonna do is keep saying why they didn't do anything right and I think that's important that you need to come forward because otherwise you the judges has nothing to go on and so you don't have an unlimited number of tries you have to demonstrate why the court should waste his time doing it or spend its time doing it and if if what you're proposing the judge says let's not spend everybody's time here because I already know that's not gonna fix it then the judge doesn't give them leave to amend but if they come forward and say look here's really here's how we're gonna fix the problem and the judge says well you're right I'll give you leave to amend and the underlying problem is they could never articulate anything other than trust me your honor we have some good stuff that that if you let us amend 
we'll show it to you then. What about the argument that they were not given the opportunity to even present what they, how the Second Amendment would look? I mean, their position is that they made the oral motion and that was denied and essentially they were precluded from going forward with an attempt to show what additional evidence they would present. Well, as demonstrated in the record, they're not shy about filing motions for reconsideration or motion for clarification. And I think that could have been brought up. And they said, Your Honor, we want you to reconsider your position because here is what we're going to present. And I really think you should give us another shot. I think the judge would have looked at it and said, OK, you gave me some basis. But without that, I don't think there was much more the trial judge could do. So our position is that there was no error by the trial court in denying the oral motion to amend the Swenson case. It says the court does not abuse its discretion in denying a motion for leave to amend if the amendment would be futile. And GHB could not articulate anything that would not make another amendment kind of a waste of time. So the first amended complaint fails to state a valid claim under the Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act. Our position is the Superior Court correctly applied the Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act, a statute of repose, and held that the claims were extinguished because they didn't assert those within the four years. And there was no reason why they couldn't have. And they couldn't articulate why they couldn't have discovered it in four years. So it seems pretty straightforward along those lines. So we are asking the court to uphold the ruling of the trial court judge as she did follow the statute and made the correct decision. Any questions? All right. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Huffaker, is that right? Yes. Yes, sorry. No, you're fine. Thank you. You have four minutes and 25 seconds. Thank you. I'll keep an eye on the clock. So I wanted to highlight something that Mr. Buck said at the end, and that it was that the trial court found that GHB obviously did not discover the deeds within the four-year window and didn't put forth anything stating why it couldn't have discovered the transfers within the four-year window. That is what the trial court said. That's a misapplication of the statute of repose. Statute of repose has two windows. The first is the four-year window, and there's no discovery rule in that window. It's a four-year hard cutoff. The second is you can file within a year of your discovery of the fraudulent nature of the transfer, not just the deed itself. That's where reasonable diligence lies. It's not in discovery of the deeds. It's in discovery of the purpose behind the nature of the transfer. And on their face, these deeds don't scream and yell, these are fraudulent transfers. They don't talk about consideration. They don't talk about whether Mr. Solomon kept possession of the properties, whether they rendered him insolvent. The only hallmark in there is that it could be to an insider from the face of the deed. Now, this notion that one of the members of GHB is married to a member of Solomon Global LLC, none of that was argued below. It's also a factual issue that would go into the pot of things a trier of fact would look at in determining whether GHB and its representatives acted reasonably in discovering the fraudulent nature of the transfer. I'd like to ask you a question just so I, in my own mind. So the four years, you say it's just a hard and fast, you know, deeds is filed, you have four years. Correct. Okay. Now, if you want to say that there's the one year exception, is it your burden to come forward and prove that? It would be the plaintiff's burden to show that it exercised reasonable diligence to get the benefit of what we call the savings clause, the additional time. Okay. And what specifically did you allege was your due diligence? That Mr. Hatch discovered the deeds on December 15th, filed within 10 years, and then to explain... 10 months. 
excuse me ten months thank your honor to explain a delay it was that he was tied up in two separate pieces of litigation with mr solomon the reason why he did file he did discover discovered the deeds themselves yes correct but there was things to discover beyond the existence of the deeds the consideration paid whether mr solomon kept possession of the properties all of these are factors of a fraudulent transfer it's not just the existence of the deed both of you have cited more v browning to us and they seem to have very different readings of it our take of more v browning is is simple and it states rather clearly that issues of reasonable due diligence and discovering the fraudulent nature of a transfer are for the jury to decide but is it is the standard that more v browning or he argues more v browning applies that you could not have discovered it with reasonable diligence correct that's and that's the language of the statute but that that happened so when when the trial court said what is your evidence that you could not have discovered it what you relied on was his extra activities with respect to litigation and lack of funds in part your honor let me let me add a little bit uh for the panel's consideration i'm getting short on time here but the trial court's may 11 2017 ruling very confusing it said first of all it blends the two windows improperly and says the ghb could have discovered the transfers not the fraudulent nature but then it goes on to hold that ghb became a quote creditor as of october 30th 2014 that led the parties into a bit of a of a confusing set of arguments about when you can sue under the fraudulent transfer act because only a creditor can sue under the fraudulent transfer act and as counsel for ghb below stated at oral argument they specifically tailored the allegations in the first amended complaint to respond to and incorporate the trial court's may 11 2017 ruling which characterized ghb as a creditor and then asked for clarification for why it called ghb a creditor as of that date if it wasn't considering ghb a creditor as of that date the trial court gave them nothing in response i see i'm out of time um i'll briefly close with our request for relief that the uh, amended judgment be reversed that the dismissal be reversed and the ghb be allowed to pursue its fraudulent transfer claims to a trier effect council uh unless there's some questions from the panel i don't see any we thank you both for your time uh, today we appreciate your arguments uh we also appreciate uh, i think we changed the date and that worked for both of you and we appreciate that as well uh with that we'll take the matter under advisement and issue a written decision in due course thank you